first is to say that uh, the webinar is being recorded, um, but don't worry, you won't be seen because we're on a webinar mode. Um, the way that we're going to run this is Keturah is going to introduce Hakim. Hakim will speak for around 45 minutes and then we'll open it up for a Q&A session. We'll run the Q&A through the Q&A um, option at the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen, uh, which is going to be on the bottom at the right. Uh, with two speech bubbles and Q&A written beneath it. So if you pop your questions in there, we'll make sure that we answer them so long as we have we have the time to. So hopefully with all that in place, um, I will hand over to Katura uh, to introduce Hakim and I will do the chairing of the Q&A after the talk. Thank you, Jonathan. So hi, everyone. So as Jonathan already said, my name is Katura and I'm the Depot Cart President. And I just quickly like to thank everyone for joining us this evening for this event, which is in collaboration with the EDI team and our panelists, Marisha and Louise. Um, and so this year, the theme for Black History Month is a time for change, actions, not words. And I'm really excited and honoured to introduce Professor Hakeem Adi, who will be speaking to us in relation to the theme, as well as about his works and research. And just to quickly introduce to kind of like talk about who he is. For those of you who may not know, Professor Hakeem is the Professor of the History of Africa and the African Diaspora at the University of Chichester. And he was also the first historian of African heritage to become a professor of history in Britain and launched the world's first online master's by research program on the history of Africa and the African diaspora in January 2018. Some of his latest publication, like his latest publication is Africa and Caribbean people in Britain, a history. And what I've done is I've mentioned to my social media officer to um, actually put the link. So if you head over to Durham Poker on Instagram, you will find the link to his publication for purchase. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly hand over to Professor Hakeem so that he can talk. Thank you so much for your introduction. I hope everybody can hear me well. Normally, I'd say it's great to be in Durham, but I'm not in Durham, so I can't say that. But it's great to be with those of you who are in Durham, although probably nobody's in Durham, for all I know. I don't know who is and who isn't. But welcome to all of you connected with the University of Durham. And it's, um, it's great to have been invited to say something in this Black History Month, as it's called. And I've taken from my theme um, the title or the concept History Matters. And I'm just going to introduce that by saying why I've chosen that. Um, this morning, I think it was this morning or, or yesterday, somebody wrote to me on Twitter about another event and they said, essentially they said, well, this is all very well, you can check it on Twitter. They said this is all very well, this history, but what we really need um, are some socio-economic uh, speakers who can talk about, they said socio-economic speakers, who can talk about the future. Um, all this talking about the past is, you know, it's all well and good, but that's not really what's required. And I said to this particular person, what makes you think that history is about the past? Um, of course, to some extent, history is about the past, but it's also about the present and about the future. History is really the study of change, I always tell my students. That's a very important subject for all of us. And so having an understanding of history is, to my mind, vitally important. One of the things about history at the moment, it seems to me, particularly this month, is it seems to be under, I won't say under threat exactly, but people seem very reluctant to talk about history. Um, it's called Black History Month and we can debate what that is all about, but surely it must be about history if it's about anything. And it appears to me that people are be a bit reluctant to talk about history and want to talk about all sorts of other things. So. Um, to me, history matters. History really matters. And I'm going to try and explain 
why I think it's so important. If I can change my slide, that is, let's try this one. Okay, here we go. So this is a slide from my latest book. It takes us back to the Roman era. It's a slide of a person, obviously it's a reconstruction of somebody who lived in the third century. She's usually known as Ivory Bangle Lady because she was buried in York with jewelry, uh, including an ivory bangle. And this is a fairly accurate reconstruction from DNA and so on, which scientists are able to do these days. And what this reconstruction of this young woman shows is that she was a, an African. And she was one of many Africans who were in Britain in Roman times, and indeed even before Roman times. Um, Along with Ivory Bangle Lady, there was a gentleman called Septimius Severus, who was also an African from Libya. He was actually the Roman emperor. And he also died in York in the third century. And there were many others. They brought with them soldiers. People came from different parts of the African continent during the Roman era, men, women, children, and their remains are still being discovered and so on. But some people, this is just, it's not really a big deal. This is just the way that Roman Britain was. It had an African emperor. It had Africans amongst its population and so on. But the reason I say that history is under threat is that some people find this information very threatening. Um, so threatening, in fact, that they attack it. They attack the actual facts of history. And I know this from personal experience because I wrote about Africans in Roman Britain about 25 years ago in a book that I wrote for young people, for children. And recently some people have attacked that book. They even made a video, which is on YouTube, accusing me of brainwashing children and the most terrible things um, because I said there were Africans here in Roman Britain and so on. So, when I say that history is uh, unpopular, it's not just history that's unpopular, but even the facts of history are under threat. And there's a great promotion of what we could call false history or the falsification of history. And that's particularly the case, we could say, where Africans, people of African heritage are concerned. It's one of the reasons why there is a Black History Month. And there has been a Black History Month for over 30 years because, for the most part, British history has excluded those of African heritage, as well as lots of other sections of the population from that history. And this month is to reflect on that absence. It doesn't, it's not in one sense a celebration because the fact that the month exists shows that there's a problem. As long as the month exists, there, will, there is a problem which hasn't been addressed in the other 11 months of the year. So this history, which people are reluctant to talk about, some people are reluctant to talk about, some people wish to distort, is actually very important. It, it matters. It matters that we have a realistic sense of the world in which we live, the nature of Britain, particularly the nature of Britain in the past, but also in the present and the future, and that also that we can draw the lessons of history. This is, I'm moving on to the early 20th century, and this gentleman's name is Walter Daniel Toll. You may have heard of him. He played for, of course, he actually played for a very good team, as you can see, Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, he, London-based club, and he was a, a striker, I suppose, in a modern term would be used. And he's one of the early black footballers. He was born in, in Folkestone, in Kent. Um, but he's not only famous for being a footballer. He's also famous because he was an officer in the British Army during the First World War. Now, in fact, he wasn't the only officer of color in the British Army, but 
to have an officer of color was quite unusual um, because there was a color bar in the armed forces at that time. And it was quite difficult to become an officer, very, very, very difficult. But some people managed it, but he was the first British born person of color to become an officer uh, during that period of the First World War. Now, normally when we talk about um, First World War and indeed even the Second World War, people are very keen to point to people like Walter Tull as examples of those who made their contribution and to show that people of African heritage, people of Haitian heritage and so on, and others made that contribution because um, in previous times they were excluded from that history. That is certainly one way of looking at the First World War, but perhaps what's more important is to understand the nature of that war. And again, in recent years, there's been some falsification of that history. I remember that uh, Michael Gove uh, a few years ago was talking about what the First World War was all about, as was Boris Johnson and others. Michael Gove said it was a just war. And uh, anyway, uh, attacked people that he called, I don't know what he called them, guardian readers and left-wing subversives and this kind of thing. Um, but it is very important that we understand the nature of that war as it is that we understand all wars. I'm going to show you another slide. This is um, attributed to a man called Isaac Hall, who was a Jamaican. It may not actually have been a comment from Isaac Hall, but you can read it for yourselves. He gives a very good analysis of what that war was about, a much better analysis than that given by Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, and others, in my view. And he makes us see the war in a very different light. I'd say a, a light that's perhaps much more a reflection of the facts of the war, which the first shots of that war were fired in Africa, and the last shots of that war were fired in Africa, one could, one could argue. Um, and it was very much about the division of Africa or the redivision of Africa as it was the division of other parts of the world. So history can provide us with that outlook. Um, and it's important that we study it, that we're not um, persuaded by the falsification of the Michael Goves, the Boris Johnson, and others who uh, presented in a rather strange way, a uh, way that, anyway, is of no benefit to the majority of us who want to understand these things and want to understand wars in general. I guess we could apply the same criteria to wars that are ongoing at the moment, but that's another subject. Maybe we can come to that later. Okay, so. To return perhaps to the theme or the supposed theme of um, tonight's lecture, which is the idea that um, words are not enough, that there should also there should be actions, and actions are better than words, or whatever the theme is. And having just written a lot of words in this book, I'm rather concerned by that view of things, that presentation of things. I don't think it's correct to say that um, actions are more important than words. Words are also actions in the sense, in the sense that people have to write them or people have to speak them. And speaking up, using words in that sense um, is very, very important action and words are important. Of course, it depends on the words and it depends on the actions. But to say one is more important than the other, and one is particularly needed now, I think is a rather strange way of looking at the world. The other thing which bothers me rather about this Black History Month theme is who made the decision? Um, this, everyone seems to have adopted this theme or this motto, but who decided? I certainly didn't decide. I'm, historian. Um, I'm quite 
connected with this issue of the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain, but nobody asked my opinion. So I'm rather suspicious of themes which appear from nowhere, and we don't know who decided and who made those decisions. And I thought I would illustrate the significance of words and action, the words and deeds, by again looking at some history. And I'm going to turn first to Alado Equiano, who we could say was a man of words, as well as a man of action, because he was best known for his famous narrative or autobiography, published in the 1780s, which was an effort to, um, we could say, to undermine the falsification of history about Africa and to present the views of Africans about human trafficking. And of course, as you know, the main business of Britain in the 18th century was human trafficking, human trafficking of African men, women, and children. Um, and Equiano was one of those who uh, took a stand against that great crime against humanity. He was also a member of an organization called the Sons of Africa, which was a kind of early pan-African organization of Africans based in mainly in the, in the capital, in London, but who agitated on this important question of human trafficking and uh, the slave trade, as it's called. Now, I say that he was a man of words and deeds. He, one of the important things he did besides writing was speaking. He toured the country, he lectured in all the principal towns, in England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland um, about this great crime. And he provided the, the voice, the words, which were extremely important to one of the most significant political campaigns in Britain's history. That was the abolitionist movement, the movement to end human trafficking, the trade in human beings. It's one of the greatest movements in Britain's history, it involved millions of people who signed petitions, who boycotted the consumption of sugar. And it's extraordinary that it's a movement we hardly ever hear anything about. It included men, working men and women, women perhaps for the first time in a major political movement and also Africans as well. But it's the kind of history we don't hear very much about. The reason perhaps being that this was the people in action, millions of people taking a stand, something they passionately, passionately believed in. It could be that the, the powers that be don't want people to have an understanding of that history. It gives us a very significant outlook on life as well, um, about what it means to be British and what the traditions of Britain are. I remember some years ago speaking to a young English teacher of history, and she was, we were talking about abolition and slavery and so on. And she said, you know, this is all very, very difficult to teach. And I said, oh, why, why would that be? She said, well, you know, it's, it's rather embarrassing. I said, oh, really? Why, why is that? She said, well, um, you know, you feel so embarrassed talking about these things. I said, well, I couldn't quite understand what she meant. And she went on to explain that she felt guilty because she assumed that her ancestors were somehow involved in the human trafficking of Africans. So I explained to her some of Britain's history. I said, look, your ancestors are more likely to have been signing a petition and boycotting sugar than they were engaged in human trafficking. But because the history of this country is suppressed and distorted, people have an entirely false view of the past. And that affects their outlook in the present, how they conduct themselves, how they see themselves how they see their identity, how they see their agency in the world. So I think that history matters. It's extremely important that we have this broad understanding of the world in which we live. Now, amongst other things, Alaro Equiano or Gustavus Vassa, as he was known, was also a member of the London Corresponding Society. London Corresponding Society was a 
say a radical organization of working men mainly. It was in fact so radical it was banned by the government. And here you see the principles of that organization, the politics of that organization. As you can see, they thought that if you were for the rights of one section of the population, for the rights of Africans, you should also be for the rights of working people in Britain. If you were for the rights of workers, rights of white men, as it's phrased here, then you must also be for the rights of black men, of Africans. This seems to me to be a very, very advanced political principle. This is two, nearly 200, over 200 years ago. But even today in the 21st century, some people don't have this appreciation of politics. The importance of standing up and fighting for the rights of all, not just fighting for a single section of the population, but fighting for the rights of all. And that is important because people live in the same society, in the same world. We're not detached from each other on the basis of skin color or eye color or any other color. We face the same problems, the same challenges, and very often from the same source. And so again, this history, this politics from the 18th century can be very useful uh, for us to reflect on and to draw the appropriate lessons from today. I'm having so much trouble with these slides. Let's go back, way back. Okay. So I'm going to stay in the 18th century for my next uh, comment on history and its importance. This man is William Anser, and he's, which he looks pretty good there. William Anser originally came from West Africa, from what is today Ghana. And he was the son of a, an African gentleman who was engaged in human trafficking. You will understand that this great transportation of millions of people across the Atlantic could not have taken place without African human traffickers as well as European human traffickers. We can get into the exact relationship between them uh, perhaps a little bit later, but I'm just gonna tell you the story of William Anser to illustrate uh, something about Britain. William Anser was, as I say, the son of that gentleman, and he was sent to Britain to be educated, as was the custom and preference for many African rulers, West African rulers in that period. And he was entrusted to a certain a gentleman who rather unfortunately uh, turned out to be rather untrustworthy. He kidnapped William, uh, enslaved him, took him to Barbados, where he was sold into slavery, and gentlemen disappeared with the proceeds. Uh, not long afterwards, William's father found out what had happened, of course, was rather alarmed that his own son should be the victim of human trafficking. He didn't see anything necessarily wrong with enslaving others, but he thought enslaving the enslavement of his own son was um, not quite the same thing. He immediately contacted his trading partners who were known as the Royal Africa Company. They rather alarmed, but he said, well, there's going to be no more human trafficking from my part of Africa until my son is returned to me safe and sound. So the Royal Africa Company sent their emissaries to Barbados. They found William. They bought his freedom. They brought him to London. They brought, bought him this rather nice suit of clothes. They took him to the opera, took him to the theatre. He resided in the uh, house of the government minister responsible for human trafficking, who had the title of the president of the Board of Trade. His portrait was painted. Somebody wrote a nice biography about him. And after two months of holiday, he was returned to his father. He was very glad to see him. And William's father said, great, that's wonderful. Now human trafficking can recommence for my part of Africa. 
Now, what this story illustrates is that human trafficking was a business transacted between the rich and powerful, or certainly the powerful in West Africa, and the rich and powerful in Britain. And I mentioned that the trading partners of William's father were known as the Royal Africa Company, and I wonder why they had that title. The Royal Africa Company was initially a royal monopoly. Indeed, all the major human trafficking enterprises were royal enterprises. Uh, it was the monarchy which headed human trafficking in Britain from the time of Elizabeth Tudor right up until William Hanover. All of them were connected with human trafficking, not just connected with it, they were the leaders of human trafficking. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us something very significant about the monarchy. The monarchy has been in the news recently, but perhaps the nature of the monarchy hasn't really been presented, nor indeed one could argue the wealth of the monarchy. I think the monarchy is valued at something like over 70 billion. Uh, nobody, certainly in the mass media, has never inquired as to where this great wealth comes from. Anyway, that's another subject for investigation. But the nature of the monarchy uh, over a period of many hundreds of years was integrally, integrally connected with human trafficking. Uh, but when you see members of that family uh, mention their regret, um, perhaps we need to go a little bit further than, than that. Okay. Let's move on. I thought I'd say something about <clears throat> this is moving into the 20th century. Um, the question of racism, which is um, always on people's minds, but has been particularly raised in this Black History Month as an important question, a question on which people need to take action and so on. Of course, racism has a very long history in this country, as does anti-racism. And if I had more time, I'd say more about anti-racism. I've mentioned Equiano. I've mentioned the words of Thomas Hardy, the London Corresponding Society, who were clearly anti-racist. But I've mentioned something about racism during the First World War, but it's always important to remember that the kind of main sources of racism in this country are very often various forms of state racism. That's to say they're not people, the man in the street or the woman in the street, they come from the powers that be. And this is one example. This is from the Second World War and it's about Amelia King, who as you can see was attempting to join the Land Army, which was an organization which recruited women in particular to help with agriculture. And she was barred from that organization because she was a person of color in the language of the time, a colored person, a black woman, uh, born in the East End of London, but prevented from joining the land army. And there are many other examples of this racism or color bar as it was referred to at the time. Uh, in this particular pamphlet, there is another example given of Leary Constantine, the famous uh, cricketer who was barred from uh, a hotel in the, in the center of London. But this was uh, a system, a policy, which was not only uh, perpetrated and maintained by the state, but was, and I could give many other examples, which I don't have time to go into now, but it was allowed in the sense that racism was not illegal. In the 1940s, 1950s, 1930s, racism was legal in this country. That is to say, it was not illegal. There were no measures taken against it. And in fact, when those measures were taken in, Parliament, they were continually voted on. There were attempts to introduce laws against racism. They were continually defeated for many years 
until 1965. So we need to understand something about the history of racism as well as the history of anti-racism uh, will certainly help us and give us an outlook which may assist us as we attempt to take action of various kinds today. And of course, people are taking action, have taken action for hundreds of years, in fact. Okay, well, this, I just thought another example um, of the approach that people took historically to solving the problems that confronted them. And this is a famous picture from the 1945 Pan-African Congress. And without going into exactly what that Congress was about, it was mainly, I guess we could say, an anti-colonial Congress, um, which in itself is important because very often what is presented about colonialism is that everybody enjoyed it, everybody liked it, everybody wanted it. And of course people didn't, people opposed it, people fought against it. And that's as, as true in uh, Britain, as it was in Africa, the Caribbean, or anywhere else. So this Congress, very famous Congress, took place in Manchester in 1945. Now, if you look to the slogans on the walls, you can see a whole variety of slogans, but the one at the, on the top left is rather interesting. It says, labor in the white skin cannot emancipate itself while labor in the black skin is enslaved. It was a, a famous slogan actually from Karl Marx, but it was one beloved of Pan-Africanists in this particular period. Um, and although they were mainly talking about Africa and the Caribbean and the, the liberation of the colonies, they were very eager in their, um, in their aspirations to and in their strategy to enlist the support of workers in Britain. And they thought that this was vital, that this unity, this common struggle uh, was as important for white workers as it was for the black workers. This was a tradition, just as it had been in the 18th century. This was the orientation that people had um, throughout this period. I could say more about that Congress, but we'll leave it for now. Here's another example, this one from the 1950s, again, talking about ending the color bar. This one is related to the Trades Council in Birmingham. This particular paper, Caribbean News, was one of the early post-war um, papers, the voice of the Caribbean Labor Congress, uh, a national organization at that time, started from the, the mid-1940s. But they too were addressing this question of racism. It's not a peculiarly modern uh, phenomenon. And again, they're approaching it from the point of view of all workers need to take up this problem. It's not just something that affected black workers, but it affected all workers in different ways. That was their understanding. And again, it's something that perhaps is worth reflecting on and thinking about why they had that particular orientation. And the last of my uh, historical slides, I think, for a moment, historical in the um, sense of being before in the last century. This is a demonstration of 1962 against the 1962 Immigration Act. It, in a way, kind of speaks for itself. No race, racism, racialism, um, no imperialism, no color bar on immigration. This was about the 1962 Immigration Act, the openly, uh, openly racist piece of, uh, of legislation. Uh, one of the earliest of post-war acts of that kind. There were pre-1945 acts which were similarly racist, but this is one of the earliest post-war ones. It's led by a woman called Claudia Jones, as you can see in the middle with the handbag, who was a, a communist from Trinidad. She's best known as being connected with the founding of the Nottingham Carnival in London. She was uh, brought up in the US but deported to Britain for her politics, for her communism. But here you see a 
a demonstration of a whole range of people united against uh, racism and this racist immigration act. So again, this is the tradition, tradition the British tradition, you could say, of approaching these things. Well, I, oh, yes, it's not my last slide. Actually, I've got two more like this. I mean, I thought this was another good example. This is from the 1970s. And this is the case of the Oval Four, four young men who were attacked coming out of Oval Station. And they found, eventually their attackers were actually plainclothes police officers who beat them up, arrested them, tortured them, made them sign various bogus statements. Um, and all this is not, was not uncommon in that period. This is the time of um, mugging or so-called muggers and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, they were sentenced. They served jail time. And it took them 50 years before Winston True, I think only last year or the year before, finally was, and all of them were exonerated after a 50-year campaign. Um, and the, the reason for that was the corruption of the leading police officer in the case. I won't go into it all now, but um, everything was completely overturned because it was shown that uh, the police were entirely corrupt. But I'm going to move on to another case uh, nearer to home. This is from uh, 2010. This is my friend, Aji Taylor, on the right-hand side and her late son, Shenny. And Shenny was killed by 11 police officers in, while he was in hospital. He was, I think, restrained is the word they use for killing people in that way. Uh, and of course, he's not the only one who's had this particular uh, very sad fate. And I have to say that Aji and her family have campaigned for years, for now for 12 years, um, to seek um, you know, some redress. They had a law change, a law called Shenny's Law, which now gives some protection to people in hospitals and places of safety. But nobody has been brought to book for this killing. And this is a, a feature of one element of state racism, because there are other forms of state racism, which one could go into, but this is one element and an important element and the impunity in which the state agencies like the police seem to have in these cases. I don't think there's ever been a prosecution of a member of the state, a police officer for the killing of anybody um, in this country, which and there have been so many deaths in police custody and related to the police is uh, almost bewildering. Uh, so again, this is the racism we can say of the state and it anyway perhaps points to again how we might look at these problems of racism and discrimination and so on, which exist in the country, and draw the appropriate conclusions from our experience and from history, which is the um, our wider experience. And all of this culminated, um, these, these uh, opposition to, to state racism, of various kinds in the Black Lives Matter movement of two years ago. But of course, one of the key demands of that movement, which was almost unprecedented, literally from Land's End to John O'Groats, people of all different backgrounds, nationalities and so on, was again the question of history, the idea that history matters, that the distortion of history, the Eurocentrism of history, the denial of history, these are things that matter to people and should not just be ignored or swept aside. So, okay, I'm conscious of time, but I'm gonna say something about another form of history matters, which 
I was myself involved in. Uh, people like to talk about actions, so let's talk about some actions. This was the part of the audience in the History Matters conference that we held in London in 2015. And that conference was held because of the problem that exists in how history is taught in this country. Um, it was occasioned by various newspaper headlines I won't go into now, but what led to it was the realization that very few people of African and Caribbean heritage are engaging with history at university level, in fact, even at school level, but particularly at university level. At that time, history was the third least popular subject amongst undergraduates of African and Caribbean heritage. There were hardly any postgraduate students from those backgrounds, hardly any uh, academics of that background, hardly any school teachers of that background. And for those reasons, we held this conference in uh, collaboration with the Royal Historical Society, Historical Association and others to discuss what was going on and to find a solution to it. The reason being that we'd raised this question with various others and it was clear they were gonna do nothing about it. So we decided to do something about it ourselves. This conference was held, it was addressed mainly by students, school students, undergraduates, postgraduates, some teachers and two specialists who study this problem of underrepresentation. And we all discussed and we came up with various recommendations, solutions, which then we had to, to implement. The first of the recommendations was to set up a project for young people, to encourage young people to engage with history and to find out about history for themselves, not to be put off by the Eurocentric way in which history is presented in schools, in universities, in other places, but to um, take up history for themselves. So we created the Young Historians Project in 2015, right after the History Matters Conference. And you can see two of the earliest members here, the one on the right, Alima was literally a, the, one of the founder members. Um, and we now have, I don't know how we've been going, what, seven years now, yes, um, with all kinds of projects. In fact, both of these two young people are now doing PhDs in history. And the Young Historians Project does a range of things. Uh, we encourage people to research history for themselves and to present it to their peers in whatever way they think is most appropriate. So people are trained to go to archives, do interviews, to do a whole range of things. I think this is a national archives. And to present it in ways that appeal to young people, but also others. It could be an exhibition online. It could be a podcast. It could be a mural. This is a mural in a hospital. It ref is reflective of the our last project, which was about African women in, in health. Um, an important subject because African women in general are very often ignored in Britain's history, even in the history of healthcare. And so the young historians did a whole project for two years on finding African women going back to the very early years of the 20th century, um, as well as modern ones, interviewing people. And one of the outcomes of that, just one, you can go to the website to see more, was this mural. There are now two murals and two more planned up and down the country. So are there any hospitals in the Durham area that would like a mural? Let me know about them. Well, another thing which came out of the History Matters conference was um, to try and find ways of encouraging young historians in other ways uh, to present their work. And so we've held two History Matters conferences. The last one was 
in 2021 and young historians they can be it could be anybody they could be people doing phds they could be people doing masters they could be doing nothing they're just researching history and they want to present something so we hold held that conference this particular one was online and the some of those papers um, in fact most of those papers will be coming out in, in book form soon so this all came out of the history matters conference there's also a history matters journal which comes out quarterly again you can find it online which has a range of um, articles book reviews all about the history of african and caribbean people in britain and then we also had one of the other recommendations of the history matters conference was to create a form of training and a qualification for older people who wanted to come back into history who'd been put off history when they were younger kind of rediscovered it as adults but um, wanted to come back wanted to get some training maybe wanted to get a qualification well there was nothing for them so we set up this master's program completely online um, which people can come back to. They don't even need to have a degree. We'll train them and um, we'll train them to be historians, essentially, is what we do. So these are all things that, these are all actions that have been taken, which came out of the History Matters Conference. Uh, people want actions rather than words, but there are lots of words in here as well. And I thought I'd end because I know time is running out. Oh no. I, I forgot I put this in. Um, I'm actually not. I'm, I'm actually going to leave that one because of time. And I end with this picture because um, this is three of the students from the MRes program graduating yesterday, and um, I only just, literally received this photo just before I just this evening, just a few hours ago, and I thought I'd end with people looking happy. Um, and yeah, we can leave it there. Thank you so much, Hakim. That was just an incredible whistle stop journey through incredible uh, people in the past and the work that they've done and bringing us right through to the really important work that you've been doing with with colleagues um, in the History Matters. And I've been fortunate enough to, to come across some of the people from Young Historians, Pro Historians Project over the last few years, and they're just doing amazing stuff there. Um, I'm gonna let people gather their thoughts and to remember if you have questions to please use the Q&A function at, at the bottom. But uh, one of the things that, um, that struck me as you were talking, and particularly as you got towards the, uh, the the contemporary things that you've been involved in in helping set up is the importance of histor historical research as a as a form of action in and of itself that is aimed at and makes contributions to the making of a more just society and it and it got me thinking about all the you know black and African, um, historians who had been outside of the academy over the 20th century and before who had, had been part of that that process do you feel yourself sort of consciously part of a of a longer tradition um or or have you felt that you've been more sort of breaking down barriers in in areas where historically it has been much more exclusive spaces like how, how, how have you seen your work i would yeah, definitely the latter in fact just to preface that by saying that uh, just to give another announcement that one of the key people in the study of african and caribbean people in britain uh, is somebody called marika sherwood who mm. is now in her 80s and isn't an academic at all <laughs> and has written and done more than anybody else over 40 years and in fact we honored her yesterday at the graduation she was given an honorary doctor of history by the university of chichester 
which is very, very long overdue. So, um, no, this kind of history, and it, and even um, to some in some regards, the history of Africa, which is my other focus. Um, although the history of Africa is taught at some universities, it, it's taught in a way that it's detached from its diaspora, um, generally speaking. And the idea of teaching them the, the two together is thought of as rather strange in this country for some reason. So because of the, the particular focus that I've always had, I've never really um, felt that I was part of an academy, <laughs> certainly not in Britain. Um, and it, it's actually quite unusual for me to be asked to speak at universities. I think it's only in the last two years that I've been asked, or two or three years, I've been asked to speak in Britain. Up until about five years ago, I was never asked to speak in Britain. I got asked to speak in the US or in Europe or in Africa or the Caribbean, but never in Britain. Um, so for most of my career, I definitely felt like, um, I wouldn't say I felt like an outsider, but I felt generally outside the academy and most of my work has always been at kind of community level in one form or another um, I've taught in a university for um, whatever that is 30 odd years or more maybe longer 30 it's anyway 30 years but I've always in addition done other forms of teaching and I've taught in adult education I've taught in prisons I've taught um, I've always seen myself as a, a teacher um, and uh, um, somebody who's, who's trying to encourage people to look at this history um, wherever they are and whatever, um, whether they're in university or school or in the community or wherever. Um, and it's only, as I say, in very recent years that the Academy has taken any interest in any of this whatsoever if that i'm not even sure where there is actually any interest certainly after 2020 various posts were created and so on but um anyway we'll, we'll see how that turns out yeah i did um i did ponder a question a, a, around asking you um about the emergence of all those posts which followed mostly from 2020 in, in black British history and um, what whether you see this as a, as a as a sustainable positive step forward or whether it reinforces some of the things which you've highlighted there about the disconnection between Africa and its diasporic communities and um I think I mean it's, it's too early to to tell and, and also to be able to tell how those posts are going to develop, um, what people are being asked to teach exactly, whether um, you know, new courses are being developed, um, whether people, I know in one case, people are kind of being asked to contribute to a range of courses to, to kind of diversify them. So it, I think it's too, too early um, to say how that will turn out and how people will be supported. I mean, I was in, put in post in 1995, um, which is quite a long time ago, probably the first one to have a, a post in Black British history, maybe. Um, and even that was quite a struggle because um, I, I taught in a... A kind of I guess a, a kind of minor award actually it was a major award um, so kind of half of a degree but that was closed down after a few years um, and eventually my whole post was closed down because the universe well not my post specifically the whole of history was closed down so you you can never be sure how these things are going to develop and I think my my advice to those who are currently in post would be not to rest on their laurels that my, my experience has been that you have to be a um you could say a, an activist you have to fight for that your your subject it's not like being a i don't know somebody who does you know 19th century social history of britain um that's yeah it's kind of it's people accept that that's a um 
a, a form of history that's acceptable and legitimate and but the kind of history that that I do it's it's um it should be seen in the same way but it but it isn't it isn't and so um you know that that struggle and encour encouraging others to become involved is very very important yeah and that that's really central in the in the ethos of the young historians project and each one teach one as a central platform within 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 that uh that project um, i'm going to remind people that they can ask questions um through the through the q and a um, and it's also open for anybody in the panel as well if they want to ask any questions of of hakim whilst whilst we have him here um otherwise it'll just uh, just be me peppering him with questions until we run out of time which i'm sure nobody wants um so whilst we wait for further questions to come in um one of the things which i think is always is interesting, particularly as you were you were talking at the start about a, I guess, a popular uh, response to the correcting of the historical record to 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 place people of color and particularly Black and African people in a past which has been imagined as 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 largely white, um, and you know, as someone who's probably been navigating this for for, for quite a long. A long time. Do you do you see any changes in in public perceptions of the past through the work that has been done, and more recently the sort of popular representations of the past, which has been a bit more attentive to addressing those previous um, those previous problems? I think it's definitely. I mean, things are ch changing all the time. Is an obvious thing to say, but um, there's there's definitely change. Um, I'm not sure how wide the knowledge is about you know Roman Britain or Tudor England or um, any any particular um, part of Britain's history there is change and people are becoming a little bit more aware but um, you know there's a kind of whole weight of history uh, against us as it were and I think I mean, some of the examples I gave, it's it's not so much that I'm attacked by racists because I talk about Africans in Roman Britain. I mean, being attacked by racists is you know, something that happens every couple of years in that way. And, uh, you know, they, anyway, for whatever reason, they seem to get hold of my books every, every few years and attack them. Um, but I think it's... I think things that are of more concern are, well, not more concern, but but the example I gave of the 18th century, he had this enormous movement, <laughs> millions of people, uh, in which Africans played a key role, it is completely almost uh, hidden in the sort of popular um, understanding of the 18th century and probably even the scholarly understanding of the 18th century that that's of more that's a concern you should say and and why is that omitted why don't people look at that movement um, and that period so i think there's a long long way to go yes you know if people know about mary seek oh great if people know about septimius severus that's great if people know about you know, John Blank or whoever, that's that's great. But it's the kind of constant um, battle. And it, it's a, a battle that's been taken up by, um, you know, the powers that be. If you, you go into the Policy Exchange website, you'll see how the great and the good are very concerned, which, is, which shows that things are changing. Um, and they're definitely in battle. Um, and trying to, to to rescue their presentation of history. I see that even Durham is listed amongst the those who are um, attempting to change history. What was it Durham had done? Um, that's right, it was trying to decolonize its maths curriculum according to policy exchange. And it had returned to Japanese flags uh, to Japan. Yeah. yeah. That was noted, policy exchange noted that 
which, which wasn't a decolonizing project, actually. Um, <laughs> no, it didn't appear to be to me, but it was noted by Policy Exchange, and they yeah. clearly have got Durham in their sight. I mean, it just shows the, the level of um, activity. The people yeah. don't know Policy Exchange was... Uh, I don't think I'm doing them any disservice by saying it's a right-wing think tank. Yeah. Yeah, its first chairman was Michael Gove. That probably tells you all you need to know about it. Uh, but it, 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 it monitors these kinds of things. We we have now got a few questions in actually, some really some really good ones for you to get your teeth. When into. I said Michael Gove, I think everybody came alive then. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, so there's a there's a quick question from from Martha asking what the surname of William the Ghanaian was. Answer um, A N S A H. Wonderful. He um, needed the fire and he should his pictures in the National Gallery or it was in the National Gallery. We've got six questions here. So uh, I'm uh, um, going to sort of read out a few of them because uh, I think they're over, uh, interestingly overlapping for you. So one from an anonymous attendee who says um, attitudes around sexuality seems to have changed more rapidly than those around race in the late 20th century and whether you have any thoughts on that or any lessons that might be drawn from those struggles so attitudes around what did you say the first thing around sexuality seem to have changed more rapidly than those around race in the late 20th century um so i mean i guess first of all do you agree with that characterization and then um whether you uh whether you believe that's the case and uh Sure that it, I'm not sure that I do agree with that. I think I'd need some convincing of that view, to be honest. Okay. Um, the the next question is from Neil Atchery, who says he thanks you for the talk um, and for us for organising it. Um, he says, in our quest to decolonise and diversify the teaching of history in Britain, is there a point where Black History Month no longer becomes necessary, or should we continue to promote Black History Month even in a decolonized future? Um, well, I think I started off um, by talking about that and saying that Black History Month is really a recognition that there's a, a problem, um, that essentially that this, this history is absent or excluded or hidden for the rest of the year. Um, so if it wasn't excluded or absent for the rest of the year, if it was, um, you know, it, it was around, if we didn't have, you know, young people of African and Caribbean heritage turned off history because it's so Eurocentric and they feel that they, their families or ancestors not rep not represented in it, if that was no longer the case, um, and if all was well with the world, then that would certainly be an argument for saying, well, we no longer need, we just have history. And, uh, you know, I think it will be a while, to be honest, before we get to that stage. Um, uh, so um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, Black History Month is problematic, it's definitely problematic, um, even having it talking talking here tonight um you know you could say what happens in november or december or january you know i i'm very busy in october which is a good or a bad thing i'm not sure but it's it's having these things sustained it's making sure that um the education system society at large um has undergone that change and that re re requires a lot. It's it's not just a problem of um, changing a curriculum. It's it's really a problem of changing society and how you do that. And of course, those one can also draw lessons from history about that. But that's how I would look at it. Just as I said, these things, the question of racism in general is very much bound up with the state, um, and you know the actions of the state state not just meaning the government and its institutions but the media and the judicial system and everything is um 
I see just the other day, there's a report come out said the Metropolitan Police were a bit racist. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, why do you need a report to, to tell you that? I mean, everybody knows that. Um, it's, it's the question is when are they not going to be racist? Not so, um, and why are they racist? Um, why is the judiciary racist? Why is the government racist? Why are the laws racist? Why is the society racist? So, and how to change that? You know what it requires to change it, and obviously it requires a very fundamental change in society, which involves everybody, everybody being involved and so on. So I think that will there will be quite a time before we get to that, that point. And so in that sense, Black History Month may be with us uh, for quite some time. And, and just going back to the first question about changes in uh, attitudes to sexuality, attitudes to, so again, I'm not sure, um, you know, how one gauges that. Um, because it, again, it comes down to has the state's attitude to these things changed? Um, you know, the state's attitude to, I mean, for example, we have the whole Windrush scandal. Um, if you actually look into that, in my book, I'll go into it in some detail. But if you look into that, I mean, it's kind of one scandal after another. Um, it's just ongoing or the Stephen Lawrence case has been ongoing for whatever it is like 30 years and every every government saying well yes we're going to deal with this we're going to have a new inquiry the thing just goes on and on and on and on and on with no change um, so again that is where the problem lies in in the way the whole you could say the whole political system is in a state of um, crisis of one sort or another mm -hmm. and the fact that racism operates in the way that it does is, is part of that crisis that needs to be um, we need to deal with um, you know again going back to what I said about the monarchy I mean how can you have a monarchy leaving aside all other things about a monarchy which has been involved in crimes against humanity for hundreds of years why would you have such an institution? So as long as these things continue, then um, things remain very much as they, as they are and that, you know, people continue to struggle to, to change them. We have um, six questions uh, still, still up there. Um, so I'll... I'll, I'll just read a couple of those out for you now, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, the first was, whilst conducting the research for your most recent book, African and Caribbean People in, in Britain, was there something which you found that totally surprised you, or is there a narrative that you were particularly fond of? The thing that really surprised me, and maybe you won't be surprised to hear this, was the levels of racism, state racism, especially in the 20th century. And I'm generally familiar with things with that history. And I've studied the 20th century for, you know, 30 years. But going through it, it's just, it just comes out and grabs you by the throat. Every aspect of everything, the First World War, the Second World War, the interwar period, the color bar, you know, is just everywhere. Is a color bar even in boxing? You couldn't fight for a British title unless you were white until 1948. Um, and then, as I say, it continues with post-war, Stephen Lawrence, Windrush scandal. It, it just on and on and on and on. It's, it actually became quite overwhelming for me as a writer because you keep thinking, well, I don't really want to write about this. Let me talk about something else. And then something so big, how can how do you ignore Stephen Lawrence? How do you ignore Windrush scandal? How do you ignore the Oval Four, somebody's campaign for 50 years to, to you know to, to to quash this unjust? It just on and on. I mean, that's why Black Lives Matter was a unprecedented national movement from Land's End to John O'Groats, literally. Mm. Land's End to John O'Groats, people came out in places you've not even heard of. Because, but what, what it, again, what Black Lives Matter showed was that majority of people in this country are just, you know, fed up 
with the way things are. You're just fed up with it. Why, you know, you think, why does this keep going on? And want things to be changed. But the, the forces of the old are, you know, keep resisting. Uh, you see it with, you know, the Colston statue is another good example. People for years have been talking about, let's get rid of this thing, it's offensive, and they did everything legally to get it removed and tried to pass resolutions and tried to do this and tried to do that. Even the mayor of Bristol couldn't do it. People said, okay, well, we'll take it into our own hands, very democratic, get rid of it. And then there's this uproar. How dare you throw, you know, get rid of this criminal and... Unbelievable, but it, it shows... It's a very good example of the majority of people taking a, you know, taking action, and the powers that be saying, "No, no, no, we can't have that. Can't have people destroying, you know, our heritage." And it's true; it is their heritage. It is the heritage of the white men of property, <laughs> yeah. you know? and they're very concerned about their heritage, and that people should be opposed to it. What's wrong with, you know, human trafficking? What's wrong with crimes against humanity? Let's have public history celebrating them. I mean, that's absolute, that's, that's the society that we live in. And while they're defending that, they're defending all these other things um, about, you know, police impunity and people being killed and racist immigration laws and, you know, all this kind of thing. So, yeah. So it's kind of connected to the previous question, I, I suppose, but a slightly different direction. Uh, Yari uh, Perez Marion asks, what advice you would have for those who want to engage more fully with, with Black British history from, from different academic disciplines? Um, Yari uh, is a literary scholar who works on Latin America, they, they tell us. Um, they ask of any pathways that strike you as more promising or productive in today's context compared to others? To engage with it, I mean, I think um, there are different ways of engaging. I mean, you can read my book. That's one form of engagement. You can go to the Young Historian's website. That's another form of engagement. Um, you can, um, there's lots of stuff online about different aspects of that history, lots of online sites. I mean, just a quick Google search will bring up lots of things. There's a very good website from the University of Glasgow, which looks at uh, basically the buying and selling of African men, women, and children in the 18th century in Britain, and those who liberated themselves by running away from that institution. There's lots of stuff online. I mean, if you look at my book, there are lots of references in it to all different types of material, of sites. Um, there are so many things that can be looked at. So I think now is a very good time to, to explore that. There are, um, there's so much material around. We have a question from Claudia, uh, and then three questions which follow, which, which are sort of, connected so i'll ask you claudia's question now try and find a way of tying the other three together in a neat neat way so claudia asks um what your thoughts are on media representation particularly since nowadays there are more there's more diversity in british period movies and tv series uh well maybe <laughs> uh maybe there is i mean there's there's more than nothing is more than nothing is more um, so that's true, but there's not that much. You know, things come along like buses, don't they? You have a couple of series and they all they kind of come along together, like Small Axe or something, or whatever it was called, and then that's it. It disappears for five years and so on. It is better. I mean, when I was young, there were no black people on TV at all. Now there are, you know, they're on in fact, I sometimes look at the adverts and think, how is this possible? Every advert seems to have black people in it. Um, so there, there are definitely changes afoot. 
in advertising, in drama, in how television is presented, in media and so on. But um, I wouldn't say it's too little, too late. There's a long way to go. I think there's a long way to go, particularly to represent things accurately. How is Africa represented generally in the media, for example? How is this history that I've spoken of today represented in the media? Um, the fact that you have, you know, a few black characters in period drama, okay, it's, that's good, but it's it, there's much more that can, can be done, I think. Okay, so the next the next three questions are are really in many ways about how we engage people, the wider publics, different publics with with black histories and made that sustained a sustained engagement. So Terence Graham asks, particularly as somebody who's working on a uh, with of a group of teachers and academics in the northeast, um, who are working on an online black history project called project north star and they want to engage school-aged children in the wider community in a way that that lasts beyond black history month and weaving that in, into teaching similarly charlie walker who work, works in access and um, wants to know how we bring in students from socioeconomically deprived backgrounds into history when professions or qualifications that lead to professions seem to be more attractive. Um, and Francesca asks, I guess, how do we engage publics who might be more hostile to these to these histories or um, the challenges connected with white fragility um, when, when people feel challenged or threatened by, by these, uh, by histories that, uh, uh, yeah. I brought it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I'm this. I kind of addressed this issue of white fragility, so called, earlier with my example of the teacher, um, and a lot of that is because things have been misrepresented in the past, and so people are, um, you know, people are just uh, confused generally and don't understand things. Um, I also gave the example, well, I gave the historical example of the 18th century, um, but you could give examples from the 19th century or the 20th century of the, the tradition in this country is, um, I'm gonna say a tradition of anti-racism. What, what we're generally, often presented with or have learned is the history of racism. So we kind of know the history of racism, but the history of racism is the history generally of the minority. There are, you know, kind of exceptions, but it's generally the history of the, the minority, the few, whereas the history of anti-racism is the history of the majority. So we shouldn't feel um, embarrassed <laughs> talking about it you know, that millions of people signed petitions against slavery in the 18th century, because they did. Or, you know, in the 19th century, there were all these anti-slavery committees with women up and down the country, and um, because there were. Or that, um, you know, in the 1920s and 1930s, you know, workers organized against racism in the port cities and so on, um, because they did. Um, and that's, if you present the actual facts of things, people say, yeah, well, that's right. I remember talking about um, the so-called riot that took place in South Shields, in the port in South Shields, um, not to an academic audience. And um, this older guy saying to me, yeah, that's right. He said, it wasn't a riot. He said, yeah, my granddad told me that or something. Um, I just told, you know, as it was, so, you know, white workers were there and they there was Yemenis or whoever was there, I can't remember now, and they, you know, they supported each other and uh, demonstrated together and or whatever the issue was then. So you just tell the truth. <laughs> it's not a question of making something up that's kind of pro-black and therefore is anti-white. You just, just tell the truth. 
and try and explain things. And sometimes, um, yeah, there, there's sometimes there's racism, but then it has to be explained. Yeah, well, because the union leaders organize things in that way to create divisions amongst workers in the ports, for example. And what were they doing? Well, they were conspiring with the ship owners and with the government against all the workers. And that's how and why racism is an attack on all workers, not just black workers. And there are many, many, many other examples of how that how racism is used and so on. So you, you tell the truth and you discuss these things. Um, and, you know, through discussion, people will see, well, actually some of the history that we, we thought actually isn't true. And things that we didn't know, uh, you know, they are, and they're about us and um, and all this. So I think the, the idea that there's kind of black history and white history is is wrong and very problematic. And in that sense, Black History Month is is also problematic. And I took great measures not to call my book uh, anything black. I mean, there, there are occasions where we use the term black and so on, but try and avoid the term black history, just as I would avoid the term white history, because that's not how it is. It's, if it's a history of Britain, it's history of Britain. Um, so anyway, that's what I'd say. I mean, I'm happy to, I can maybe, you know, you can email me and I can say more. Um, the question of teaching, again, is, is a bit similar. Um, how do you introduce it into teaching? Well, it's just history. <laughs> you're talking about Roman Britain why not talk about Ivory Bangle Lady or September Severus you're talking about Tudor England where you can talk about John Blank or you can talk about uh, anyone, whoever you want to talk about who, who happened to be there or you're talking about the First World War or the Second World War or the, we've got a whole GCSE course on migration there's a textbook um, and you know Britain's a country of migrants. If people want to talk about black history, then we can go back to Cheddar Man, who the Daily Telegraph proclaimed was black. And all Britons were black 10,000 years ago in that sense, and all Europeans. <laughs> Tell people that. that, will, that will, um... Anyway, change their perspectives on the history of Britain and the history of Europe. Um, so there are ways of doing, you know, I don't think it's, rocket science. I don't think people should be frightened of it. You know, I just think you embrace it and so on. I mean, similarly with access, um, yeah, I mean, people may not be interested in history. Well, why are they not interested in history? You know, if you say, you know, what did, you know, what what was, who was playing for Newcastle in the 1930s? Um, but, oh, yeah. People look at whoever it was, Jackie Milburn, whoever it was. People say, oh, yeah, it's really interesting. Well, that's history. <laughs> so you anyway you can approach things there are different ways of approaching history um you know even the where you live there's there's history there's a way things are the way they are the way that roads are named in a certain way um you know there's so many approaches to it the history of music the history of sport the history of this you know one can be a bit innovative and bring in different ways of um, looking at the world. Or one can look at, you know, the news or the newspaper headlines of a year ago or a month ago and examine those. Um, or something that people are involved in. You take a local strike or something and look at how the local press or the national press cover it um and get people to think critically about these things is that actually what happened no i was on the picket line it wasn't like that or whatever and you get people to think it's about looking at the world history is about the world in which we live it's not you know it's not something alien to people's experience it is people's experience um it's their family's experience and so i think there are lots of ways of approaching this and bringing in various elements um, even what we eat and where it comes from and how long it's been coming and anyway it's it's just life it's it's nothing peculiar in that respect so i think you have lots of opportunities for 
talking about history. Thank you so much, Hakimi, Hakim. I, I'm conscious of the time and the need to, to wrap it up, but I just wanted to thank you for such an inspirational talk and that has solicited some wonderful responses in the questions and some nice comments as well about people who've accessed History Matters journals and uh, and found those useful. So uh, it's 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 been it's been really great and uh, thank you everyone for coming and for participating. So so well, I hope that your experience of doing a, a Zoom public talk like this has has been a positive one, Hakeem. Very uh, much so. Very and much we so. will uh, we'll plot to get you up here in person in, in the future. Brilliant. Look forward to it. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Cheers. Take it easy. Good luck with all that history teaching.